I would like to talk to you a little bit this evening about our God, about our Jesus, about our Savior. I would like to begin this evening by asking you a few questions. <clears throat> How many here, you can raise your hand if you want, you don't have to. How many here have ever struggled with the temptation that you thought it would be impossible for you to overcome. Now I'm going to raise my hand because I've been there, done that. Anybody else here? Yeah, there's, there's quite a number of courageous souls out there that have raised your hand and said, I've struggled with one that at the time it seemed like I probably could not overcome that temptation. Next question. What did you say to yourself when you yielded? Did you say, I have no right to call myself a Christian after what I just did? God can never accept me as long as I continue yielding to this temptation. And worst of all, I'll be lo I guess I'll be lost. Now, we all go through this process all the time. It's called internal self-talk. Dialoguing with ourselves. I mean, throughout the day, we're constantly in our minds talking to ourselves. Every waking moment. That's what it means to be alive, is we're thinking. And much of what we think about is about ourselves in relation to the world and in relation to other people in relation to God and and how God feels about what we're doing self-talk and it's so easy as Christians when we yield to a temptation that we have been struggling against to tell ourselves this condemning self-talk I'm no good I'm not really a Christian and I guess God cannot accept me as long as I continue yielding to this temptation and maybe some of us even go so far as to conclude that well I guess I'll be lost other people will be will make it to the kingdom but I don't think I can because I can't seem to overcome this temptation Paul responds to all this internal self-talk this condemning self-talk. He responds to it in Romans chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, you might like to turn with me to Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> We're going to look at verse 20. And I'm going to wait until everybody has, on the front row that I can see has found Romans 3 verse 20. Paul says, therefore no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. Now, Paul, I'm reading from the NIV, and Paul said no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. In the King James it says no one will be justified in his sight by observing the law. To declare righteous, to be justified, mean essentially the same thing, and basically what we're talking about is being accepted by God. So let's read the text that way. Therefore, no one will be accepted by God on the basis of observing the law. Rather, through the law we become conscious of sin. So Paul says the only function that the law has is to show us what sin is. The law cannot help us to overcome its own requirements. The law cannot make us more acceptable to God when we violate its precepts. All the law can do is say, you did it. That's as far as it goes. 
Now Paul said, no one will be accepted by God on the basis of his observance of the law. Now here you are saying to yourself, I guess God cannot accept me because I keep breaking the law. But Paul just said, no one is accepted by God on the basis of how well he keeps the law. Or, on the, no one is rejected by God on the basis of how much he fails to keep the law. So how does God accept us? On what basis? Well, let me give you a little bit more bad news and then we'll look at the good news. The bad news is that God can only take to heaven people who are sinless. People who are absolutely perfect are the only ones that qualify for entrance into God's kingdom. People who are absolutely perfect are the only ones who are acceptable to God. Now, this puts a huge problem onto God because you see, God loves us and he doesn't want to see us lost. But he cannot accept imperfect people. God can only accept perfect people. God can only save perfect people in his kingdom. Now, if it was me trying to figure out this problem, I'm afraid it would have me stumped. I wouldn't know what to do. Fortunately, God is much wiser, much more powerful than I am or than any of us. And he's figured out a way to solve this problem. We read about it in verse 21. Paul says, rather, no, pardon me, verse 21, but now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. Now let me give you just a little bit of a Greek lesson here. The Greek, uh, well let me give you first what the King James Ver how the King James Version translates this. In the NIV it says, but now a righteousness from God. The King James says, the righteousness of God has been revealed. Now in the Greek, there is no definite article. So it is not the righteousness of God. According to the Greek, it is a righteousness either of God or from God. Now, according to the Greek, it could go either way in the English language. We could either say righteousness from God or the righteousness of God. Well, the King James says, but now the righteousness of God. So let's think about that a moment. It says the righteousness of God has been revealed. Now, in that sense, it simply means that God's perfect righteousness has been made known to you and me. And that's a good thing. After all, we need a model uh, that will show us how we should live. And that's why Jesus came to this world. He's God. And he came to this world as God to show us how to live. So it's not that the King James is theologically incorrect because uh, Jesus is the righteousness from, uh, of God revealed to you and me as a model. However, I propose to you that that's really not what Paul is talking about in this verse. I believe Paul means, but now a righteousness from God has been revealed. You see, the problem is this. We cannot keep God's law well enough, good enough, to be acceptable to God, to make ourselves acceptable to Him. We can't do that. Well, where are we going to get the righteousness then that we need in order to be acceptable to God? And God solved the problem by giving us His righteousness, Christ's righteousness. Now a righteousness from God for you and me has been made known. That, I believe, is what Paul is talking about in Romans 3, 20 and 21. A good illustration of this is 
we find in the parable of the prodigal son. You'll recall that this young man left home with one-third of his father's wealth in his pocket. There were two brothers, and in that culture, the oldest son received twice as much inheritance as the other sons because the oldest son was supposed to be the priest in the family. He was supposed to take care of the parents in their old age, so he received twice as much inheritance as the other sons. And since there were two boys, the oldest son received two-thirds and the younger son one-third. And so this young man leaves home with one-third of his father's wealth in his pocket. Now this fellow was, this, uh, this farmer, this father, was a pretty, pretty wealthy man. Um, he had servants, we know that. He raised cattle. Uh, and he, in, in today's world, he would probably be a millionaire and maybe a multimillionaire. So this kid leaves home at least with several hundred thousand dollars in his pocket in today's money and he goes down to the big city and he wasted on wine, women and song. And we know that he apparently was enjoying female companionship because and apparently the family knew something about what was going on because when the older brother came in from the field he said this son of yours who has wasted your living on prostitutes. That's what the, that's what the older son said to the father when he came back to see the party. Now, I don't know about you, but if, if my son, and I'm glad my son is much more responsible than to do anything like that, but if my son were to take one-third of my wealth and, and squander it on prostitutes, I wouldn't be too happy. And this young man realized that when he ran out of money, and just about the time he runs out of money, there's a huge famine in the land and he has no job, no source of income. The only thing he can find to do is out there in the, he's, he's hired himself to a, a Gentile who raised pigs and he's out there in the pigsty taking care of these filthy animals. Sometimes you have to hit bottom in order to look up, you know. And out there in the pigsty he finally woke up. He finally looked up. And he said to himself, this is nonsense. My father's servants are in better shape than I am. They're getting along better than I am. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back home and I'm going to say, Dad, I blew it. I blew it. Uh, I don't deserve to be called your son anymore not after what I've done. But Dad, could you just find it in your heart to let me be one of the servants around the place? At least I could be around the family and I'd be glad to work for you the rest of my life. And having decided to do that, he set his feet on the path to home. And um, when he got there, Surprise! The father runs out to meet him, throws his arms around the young man, and the young man starts his speech. Dad, I blew it. I don't deserve to be called your son. After all that I've done, wasted one-third of your wealth, but Dad, if you could just let me be one of the servants around the place. Do you remember what the father said next? He said to the servants, apparently the servants had followed him out of the house, and he said to the servant, go get the best robe and put it on him. The best family robe. And you know, the Bible doesn't say that the father said to the young man, now son, you, those stinky dirty clothes of yours, we don't want to put the best family robe over those stinky clothes. So I'll tell you what, son, you, you run inside, take off those dirty clothes, let mother wash them, and, and you go take a shower. And when you're cleaned up, then come back out here, and, and I want to put the best family robe on you. It's not what the Bible says. According to the Bible, according to Jesus' own story, the best family robe went right over the dirty, filthy, smelly clothes. 
Now, what does that best family robe represent theologically? It represents the righteousness of Christ. In other words, Jesus doesn't say to us, look, friend, if you'll overcome some of these temptations you've been struggling with, if you'll, if you'll gain a few victories and clean yourself up a bit, then I'll be glad to cover you with the robe of my righteousness. It's not the way it works. The robe of Christ's righteousness goes right over our dirty, filthy, sinful lives. I would like to illustrate this for you. Now, I would like to invite Elder Wright to come up here. What do you see in this little uh, container? Looks like mud. Looks like mud. Slimy mud. It is mud. Would you put a finger in there and stir that around a little bit? It needs to be, it's kind of gotten thick at the bottom. Just stir it up real good. Oh, Get, this is going to be nice. Okay, put several fingers in there and just really make it, okay. Now then, very good. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's good at making mud pies. I've had practice. Yeah. <laughs> now, I want you to do, you've got those fingers nice and dirty, just do that, okay? Right on my shirt. He's having a good time. Other side, again, oh, some more. Yes. All right, very good. Give him a hand. Thank you. Just a minute, we're not through yet. All right, now, he's got a dirty hand yeah, here. We need, to have, we need to have a little baptismal service here. Oh, you came prepared. I I'm did. I'm impressed. And then, I even came prepared with a nice towel for you to dry <laughs> these off with. The nice towel is compliments of the uh, conference center. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad we could assist. <laughs> Thank you, Elder Wright. Well, I feel better. How do you feel? I feel fine. My shirt doesn't, but that's all right. It'll survive. Now, I have a question for you. What does all this dirt on my shirt represent? Represents sin, doesn't it? We had a good solution for Elder Wright. We had a little baptismal service for him here. But I still have a problem. Fortunately, there is a lady by the name of Josie who is going to come out here, and she has the solution to my problem. Thank you very much, Josie. What does this long-sleeved white shirt represent? The robe of Christ's righteousness. I didn't have to send this shirt to the laundry. That would have been an inappropriate representation of Christ's righteousness. Christ's righteousness covers my sins and Christ's righteousness washes me of my sins. If there's a laundry at all, it's Christ. Now then, is there anything that you and I have to do to qualify to receive this robe of Christ's righteousness? And the answer is yes. Paul hastens to tell us what that is. In the very next verse, verse 22, he says, This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Our part is faith, belief. Now, in the Greek, there's only one word for faith. But in English, we have two two words. One is faith and the other is belief. Uh, Paul, in the English we use both of those words in this verse, but Paul said it this way. If we're translating it literally from the Greek, Paul said, this righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who have faith. To Paul it was so important that we understand that faith is our part that he said it twice in this verse. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that faith a little bit later on.
Well, there is one thing about that faith that we need to talk about right now. There is such a thing as cheap grace. And cheap grace is really a misapplication of righteousness by faith. So let me give you a, a description of true faith. Number one, we are justified and forgiven of our sins by faith. Well, now then, that means that true faith needs to have some understanding of sin. What is the faith attitude towards sin? True faith says, God hates sin, and therefore, so do I. Now, that's fairly easy to do. How many of you here hate it when you read in the newspaper about these terrorists over in the Middle East that blow up innocent people? How many of you hate it when you read in the newspaper about some crazy man who walks into a uh, convenience store and shoots the clerk in cold blood? How many of you hate it when you read in the newspaper about somebody who rapes little girls or who rapes women? We hate those things, don't we? So, in one sense, it's easy to hate sin. But, true faith says, God hates my sin, and therefore so do I. And that's another matter, because brothers and sisters, you and I love our sins. We wouldn't do them if we hated them. We don't want to get rid of our sins. We enjoy them too much. But, true faith says, God hates that sin, and therefore, I'm going to put my si myself on the side of obedience. And I may not obey perfectly, but I'm on God's side. I'm putting myself on God's side. side. I'm putting myself on the path to victory. And then true faith says, I'm committing myself to victory. I don't care how long it takes. I don't care how hard it, it, it is. I am putting myself on the path to victory. True faith can say, I don't even know how I'm going to gain the victory. I mean, we've, several of us, quite a number of us here this evening, raised our hands and said, I've experienced a time in my life when I felt that this particular sin I was struggling with, I could never overcome. I've been there. I understand those of you that raised your hands, because I raised mine. True faith can say, I don't know how I'm going to overcome this sin, but God knows, and I'm putting myself on the pathway to victory, and I'm going to let him show me how to overcome this sin. Now, my point is this. True faith is loyal to God's law, even if it isn't able to keep it. You're not disloyal to God's law just because you break it. You're disloyal to God if you rebel and you say, God, I don't care what your law says. I enjoy this and I don't intend to try to overcome it. Then that's disloyalty and God cannot accept people who are disloyal to his law. But God is very willing to accept people who are totally loyal to his law and just haven't learned yet how to overcome, how to keep it. And you say, well, prove that one from the Bible. Very well. Romans chapter 7, 14 to 25. This poor man, Paul himself, I think, who said, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, that I do. Now, was this man loyal to God's law? Of course, in fact, he said there, in one verse there, in, in, in that passage, he said, I delight in God's law after the inward man. He loved God's law. He delighted God's law. He was totally committed to God's law. He wanted desperately to keep it. He just didn't, couldn't see it. He, he couldn't do it. I think every one of us has been there, done that. True faith puts itself on the side of obedience even if it is not able totally to keep God's law yet. Then Paul says, in verse 23, For all his sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace. Now here we need to do a little more Greek. A little more grammar. Paul said two things here. Number one, he said, all have sinned. And number two, he said, and fall short of the glory of God. Now this is what we call 
in literature, in Hebrew literature at least, parallelism. Uh, if you read through the Psalms, you'll discover a lot of parallelism where the psalmist says one thing in one line, and the very next line he says the same thing in a different, uh, with different words. Did you ever notice that in the Psalms? Okay, that's parallelism. That's Paul was a Hebrew. He thought in Hebrew literary terms, and so that's what is going on in this verse. Verse 24, verse 23, he says, All have sinned, line one, and fall short of the glory of God, line two. So falling short of the glory of God and sinning are all the same, uh, they all mean the same thing. Now, next part of our grammar lesson. All have sinned. Is that past tense, present tense, or future tense? Anybody want to tell me? All have sinned, past, present, or future? Past, thank you. And fall short of the glory of God, past, present, or future? Present, exactly, you all just passed, A's. Then in the very next verse, and are justified freely by His grace. All have sinned in the past, and fall short in the present and are justified. It's easy enough to understand that we are justified of our sins of the past. And of course, even the sins of the present are instantly the past as soon as we commit them. Nevertheless, this is what I propose to you. When you sin, that is, in the present, fall short of the glory of God, you are justified. And you say, wait a minute, Pastor Moore. How can you say that? Well, you know there are some people who believe that every time they sin, they break their relationship with Jesus. Did you ever hear that little bit of theology? Every time they sin, they break their relationship with Jesus and they don't get it back until they confess the sin. And uh, so... They're in God's grace one day, out of it the next, in God's grace the next day, and out of it the next. It's what I call a yo-yo Christian experience. Up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. And that's not a very happy Christian life. There's another way I can prove to you that this is wrong. Paul said that we are adopted into God's family. You remember reading that in, in Paul's writings? That we're adopted into God's family, we're his children by adoption. Anybody here that has a son or daughter that they adopted, raise your hand. All right, now then, I'd like to see the hands of all of you who raised that hand. If your child lived perfectly, never disobeyed you, I'd like to see your hand up again. No hands. Well, another question. When that child disobeyed you, did that void the adoption papers? This child is no longer legally your child once uh, it disobeys. Is that the way it works? Of course not. That child is your child and when it disobeys, legally it is still your child. Brothers and sisters, I propose to you that you and I are adopted into God's family and God does not de-adopt us or unadopt us every time we sin. Remember the robe went right over that young man's dirty, filthy clothes. And you and I are dirty, filthy with sin. The robe of Christ's righteousness goes right over that dirty, filthy, those dirty, filthy rags. And Jesus does not reject you just because you yielded again provided you have true faith remember true faith has put itself on the side of obedience true faith has made a commitment I don't know how I'm going to overcome to me right now it seems impossible to overcome this temptation but I'm putting myself on the path of obedience and I'm gonna let God lead me a step at a time until I gain the victory now that's loyalty and it's loyalty that God is looking for in order to cover you with the robe of His righteousness, not perfection. And if you can say in your heart of hearts, Jesus, 
I'm committed to overcoming this temptation and I don't know how long it's going to take. I know it's going to be painful, but I'm putting myself on your side and even if I yield from time to time, I'm still on your side. I'm getting up and starting over and uh, learning from this mistake. I can assure you that you have not broken your relationship with Jesus. You are still in a saving relationship with him. And even if you haven't had a chance yet to confess the sin, if you were to die that next moment, you would be in God's kingdom. That's the gospel. You've heard people talk about the gospel? That's the gospel. I think there are so many Adventists that have been running around guilty and afraid and I mean there's a place for guilt I'm not saying we shouldn't feel guilty but to just run around perpetually and continually in a state of guilt and fear that God does not accept me because I have not yet overcome this temptation you are saying to yourself that your acceptance by God depends on your obedience and Paul flat out denies that in Romans he said no one is accepted by God on the basis of his obedience to God's law that's not the basis of our acceptance the basis of our acceptance is God's righteousness Christ's righteousness which he gives to us as a gift and he gives us that gift for the sins of the past and he gives us that gift for the sins of the present even the sins that we commit now if I'm committed to overcoming then the robe of Christ's righteousness remains. How about confession? I would like to suggest to you a prayer and you can take the gist of this prayer and say it yourself the next time you yield. God, I confess that I have sinned. That needs to be the first thing you say in a prayer of confession. God, I confess to you that I've sinned. But, I thank you that in spite of the fact that I just yielded to this temptation, I am still a righteous man, a righteous woman in your sight. I don't feel like I deserve this gift. I don't feel like it's mine. But by faith, I will act contrary to my feelings and claim your righteousness because you have offered it. Now, I, got, I began this evening by talking about self-talk. All this internal dialogue, especially what we say to ourselves when we have just yielded to that temptation. I have no right to call myself a Christian. I guess God cannot accept me as long as I keep yielding to this temptation. I guess I'll be lost. And some of us here this evening know exactly what that kind of self-talk is because you've been saying it to yourself for years. I'd like to give you another self-talk except I call this Jesus talk thank you father that I'm still a righteous man a righteous woman in your sight in spite of the fact that I just yielded to this temptation I praise you heavenly father that I'm innocent in your sight you said innocent I said innocent yes did you know let me tell you something Ellen White says in Steps to Christ, page 62, she says, Christ's character stands in place of your character and you're accepted by God just as if you had not sinned. Christ's character stands in place of your character and mine. Character is what we're like on the inside. All this, all this messed up on the inside, the temptations we struggle with, the feelings, the emotions, the, the fantasies that we struggle with, that's our character. That's what we're like on the inside. Ellen White says, Christ's character stands in place of your character. When God looks at you as a Christian, he doesn't see all this mess that's going on on the inside. He sees Christ's perfect character. And Ellen White says, you are accepted by God just as if you had not sinned. Now, to be accepted by God just as if you had not sinned is to be accepted by God just as if you were perfect. 
How many people here tonight can say, I'm perfect? I see one or two brave hands. Everybody, please raise at least one hand. Put up two if you would like. I want to see everyone's hand raised. Sister, right here, thank you. Okay, right here. Everybody raise a hand. Now I'm looking at the hands of all the perfect people this evening. Perfect in God's sight, not because you are perfect within yourself, but because Christ's robe of righteousness covers you, and when God looks at you, he doesn't see you, he sees Christ. He sees Christ's perfect life. And you can say, Father, I praise you and I thank you that right now I am totally innocent in your sight. And you can say that immediately after you just got through yielding to that temptation. I know that sounds like heresy to some people, but it's true because Paul said it and the Bible says it. Amen. And this is Jesus talk. Jesus talk. It's going to take you a little while, especially if you've been punishing yourself with guilt all these years over not being able to overcome this temptation and you've about given up on yourself and God. It's going to take you a while, it's going to take you some practice to learn how to say this Jesus talk, especially when you just got through doing it. And the temptation is raging in your mind to feel guilty and to wallow in that guilt. But I want to tell you something. This Jesus talk that I'm sharing with you is a starting point for victory over sin. If you expect to gain the victory, then you're going to have to put aside this self-talk that I spoke about to begin with and you're going to have to learn Jesus talk Father I thank you and I praise you that in spite of what I just got through doing what I just got through thinking I'm still innocent in your sight because Christ's righteousness covers this sin that I just committed Thank you, Father. I propose to you that God has a hobby. I have a friend in Idaho, a man, who one of the things he enjoys doing most is cleaning house. And he especially enjoys cleaning the kitchen floor. He likes to get a rag, a damp rag. And you know, ladies, how in the kitchen you've got this little, uh, the, the cupboards come down just so far and then it goes under and there's a, there's a little board there that, and then the floor comes in there. Okay, now you all know, especially the ladies here know, maybe a few of the men do too, that an awful lot of dirt can get collected underneath that those cupboards doors and drawers right well my friend a man loves to get a damp cloth and go around and clean under all of these doors and drawers in the kitchen he really enjoys that God has a hobby. God's hobby is getting inside of dirty, filthy minds and cleaning them out. Now you may be tempted to think, well, God surely cannot get into my mind and clean it out. I'm too sinful. But now stop and think of this. Hobbies are things that we do for fun, right? And frankly, the more challenging a hobby is, the more fun it is, right? Usually. And that's the way it is with God. The more sinful you are, the more fun God has getting inside of your mind and cleaning it out. You cannot be too sinful for God to want to get inside of your mind and help you clean it out. The more sinful you are, the more fun God has 
getting in there and cleaning your mind out. So forget about this business of you're too sinful for God to clean you out. Because the more sinful you are, the more he enjoys getting in there and cleaning you out, the more anxious he is. The more sinful you are, the more you qualify for God's grace. Ellen White said, Christ delights to take apparently hopeless material, those whom Satan has debased and through whom he has worked, and make them subjects of his grace. Amen. Gospel Workers, page 516, 516. Let's take the case of a man who's addicted to internet pornography, okay? That's a fairly common problem. And I'm told that Christians tend to have that problem on about an equal percentage with non-Christians. Surveys show that 30% of preachers are to one degree or another addicted to sex or have sexual struggles. Now don't go home and confront your preacher. <laughs> but that's what surveys show. And surveys show that the same is true of the general Christian population. 30, maybe even 40 percent of Christians struggle with sexual issues and sexual addiction to some extent. I think that, frankly, I think that all of us, I mean, we're all sexual beings and we all have to learn how to deal with this aspect of our nature and so all of us have probably yielded to some kind of sexual temptation at some time or another, even if it's nothing more than a sexual fantasy. We've all, we've all had to deal with this. Now here's this man addicted to internet pornography. I mean, he spends several hours a night in front of that computer monitor on the internet watching these lustful images. But he's a Christian, and he knows that he shouldn't be doing this. And so he says to himself, I really need to turn this computer off and ask God to help me. That's backwards. What he needs to say to himself is, I need to ask God to help me and turn the computer off. Right? You see, God comes into your dirty, filthy mind in the midst of whatever the sin is that you're struggling with. And I use internet pornography because it's especially a sin of the mind as much as any sin. I think all sins have start out as sins of the mind, but internet pornography is especially easy for us to understand. And it's easy for us to suppose that we need to do a little bit of cleanup on our own and then ask the Holy Spirit to come in because surely God is not interested in coming into my dirty, filthy mind. If God only knew, let me tell you something, God knows exactly what your dirty, filthy mind is like. He understands it a whole lot better than you and I do. And God is anxious to come inside of that dirty, filthy mind and help you to start cleaning it up. If a man falls into a pit and breaks two arms and one leg, how is he going to get out? Somebody else has to get down in that pit with him and help him out, lift him out. And if you and I are going to escape from this pit of sin in which we are sunken, we cannot expect to get ourselves out on the outside of the pit and then say, God, help me to not fall back into it. We've got to have help from the start. We've got to have, Jesus has to come down into the pit, enter our dirty, filthy minds with his Holy Spirit and start cleaning us out. We simply give the permission. There's a um, statement by Ellen White in uh, Selected Messages, book one, page 382. Selected Messages, book 1, page 382. And here's what Ellen White says. When it is in the heart to obey God, when efforts are put forth to this end, Jesus accepts this disposition and effort as man's best service, and he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit. Now let's analyze that. When it's in the heart to obey God, that means I want to obey God. 
When efforts are put forth to this end, that means I'm trying to obey God. I'm doing my best. Jesus accepts this disposition and effort as the best that we have to offer. And he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit. And the deficiency is the sins that we commit. Even though we don't want to, it's in our heart to obey God. We're doing everything we know to obey God. And yet we yield to the temptation anyway. And Ellen White says, Jesus accepts our desire to overcome and our weak, feeble efforts to overcome is the best that we have to offer at that moment. And he makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit. And I propose to you that he does it instantly. I don't think Jesus turns to the Father and says, Now, Father, um, Marvin Moore just sinned. Why don't we wait five or six days to be sure that Marvin Moore is serious about dealing with this sin and then we'll cover him with my righteousness? No. I don't think Jesus has to wait five days, five hours, or five minutes, or five seconds because you see, Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit can read our minds. Now if it was me looking at you, I'd probably have to wait five or six years to figure out whether you deserved Christ's righteousness. But Jesus and the Spirit and the Father can read our minds and they know instantly whether we have been seriously uh, wanting to obey and trying to obey, doing our best. And they know instantly that they can apply Christ's righteousness to you and me because they can see we're serious about this. We really want to overcome. We're doing our feeble best to overcome. We just didn't quite make it. Christ's righteousness instantly applied to your case. Now, I would like to call your attention to one more passage in Romans before we close. Romans chapter 6 and verse 14. This is actually a, a verse that is quite familiar to Seventh-day Adventists because people have been throwing it up to us for the past 150 or 60 years. Paul says, sin will not be your master because you're not under law but under grace. In the King James it says, sin will not have dominion over you because you're not under law but under grace. It's all the same thing. And for 150 years, the non-Adventists who keep Sunday have thrown this up to us and they've said, you see, we don't have to keep the Sabbath. I mean, we're not under law. And so you say, well, that's interesting. I guess that I can run out and have an affair and run out on my husband or my wife. No, 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 you can't do that. Well, why not? I'm not under law. No, 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 no. The, 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 the seventh commandment says, thou shalt not commit adultery. And you say, oh, I thought I wasn't under law. Well, I guess I can go over to Walmart and, and shoplift a little bit. No, 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 you can't do that. The, the, the eighth commandment says, you shall not steal. Interesting, I thought I wasn't under law. Well, I don't like my neighbor very well. I guess that I'll go take a gun and shoot him. No, you can't do that. The Sixth Commandment says, I shall not <coughs> kill. <coughs> you see, these people are, are happy for us to keep all nine of the commandments, but when it comes to the Fourth Commandment, <coughs> suddenly we're not under law. We're under grace. Well, the problem is that this is a total misapplication of what Paul said. It's pulling the few words, we are not under law but under grace, it's pulling them out of their context. And the context is simply the first half of the verse. Sin shall not be your master. Sin shall not have dominion over you because you're not under law but under grace. Now, I think everyone here, some of us I guess in particular, understand what it means to, for sin to have the mastery over us. It's a situation Paul found himself in when he said, the things I want to do, I don't. The things I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. This sin that we feel like, I don't think I will, can, can overcome this. This sin we keep yielding to. This temptation we keep doing. And punishing ourselves with guilt over. Paul said, that sin will not be your master provided you're under grace. 
Now, if you're under law, that sin will continue to be your master. But if you're under grace, the mastery, the slavery, the dominion of sin over your life will be broken. Therefore, it becomes critically important that we understand what it means to be under law and what it means to be under grace. I'll start with law. There are two ways to be under law. They are, psychologically, they are polar opposites. Theologically, they are identical. Here's the first way to be under law. God, you must really be pleased with me. I keep the Sabbath. I pay my tithe. I practice health reform. I'm an elder in the church. Um, I'm very faithful about fulfilling all the responsibilities that the church asked me to do. And God, you must really be pleased with me. I'm such a good Christian. I'm, thank you, Jesus. I'm pleased to be such a good Christian. I doubt there are very many people here tonight who are under law in that sense. Here's the other way to be under law. Oh, God. I just blew it again. I did it. For the thousandth time, I guess I won't be ever be able to overcome this temptation. I don't see how you can accept me. I guess I'll be lost. You know, this is the self-talk that we were talking about earlier. Psychologically, it's the polar opposite to the proud man. The proud man is like the Pharisee that went into the temple, you know, and prayed, and what a, thank God what a good Christian he was. Not very many of those people, I think, in the Adventist church. Most of us are like the discouraged publican who is so discouraged and feels like God simply cannot accept me because of how bad I've been, can't overcome this temptation. You see, the proud man and the discouraged man, polar opposites psychologically, but exactly the same theological assumption, God cannot accept me unless I perform perfectly. Now, the proud man thinks he has performed perfectly, and the, the uh, guilty man, the, the discouraged man, thinks that he has not performed perfectly, but both of them assume that the only basis of acceptance by God is to be, is to perform perfectly. That's what it means to be under law. So if you're one of these people who's been running around saying to yourself, God, I guess that I'll be lost. I, I don't see how you can accept me because of all this, the, the way I keep yielding to this temptation. Well, you're under law. Because you are assuming that your acceptance by God depends on your performance. When you start overcoming this temptation, then maybe you'll be acceptable to, to, by, to God. And you know, may, maybe for a while you go along and you are successful in overcoming the temptation, and you're praising God, and you're finally feeling good about yourself, and feeling like God finally can accept you, and then boom, one day you discover yourself on the ground again, and you're back to square one. Well, that's because of the theological assumption that God can only accept you when you're successful in overcoming that temptation. That's what it means to be under law. And Paul said, if you're under law, then sin is going to continue to be your mastery. Maybe that's the reason why you continue yielding to this sin, because you're putting yourself under law all the time. So what does it mean to be under grace? It, because Paul said the, the pathway to victory, the way to break free of the mastery of sin over your life, is to be under grace. What does that mean? To be under grace means to say the prayer that I read to you earlier. God, I confess to you that I've sinned, but I thank you and praise you that in spite of the fact that I yielded to this temptation, and you name it, you name the temptation, I'm still a righteous man, a righteous woman in Christ Jesus. I don't deserve this gift. I don't feel like it's mine. But I will act contrary to my feelings and accept it because you've promised it. Jesus talk. Grace. Grace talk. Let me tell you something. Your greatest struggle in putting yourself under grace may very well be not the struggle against the temptation, but the struggle to put yourself under grace. When you have just yielded and you feel so guilty and you've been so much in the habit 
of condemning yourself every time you fall into that trap of the devil's trap and you yield to that temptation and you you're, you become so accustomed to this condemning self-talk your greatest struggle may be to learn Jesus talk God I thank you that in spite of the fact that I just yielded to this temptation I'm still a righteous man a righteous woman in your sight thank you for that beautiful gift and to really believe it you know Paul said in Romans chapter 5 verse 1 having been justified by faith we have peace with God and when you learn Jesus talk when you learn grace it brings such tremendous peace it has for me it has and this is the beginning point for victory as long as you keep putting yourself under law whether it's the proud Pharisee or the condemned publican you're going to continue yielding to that temptation it's very simple but when you put yourself under grace and you learn Jesus talk praise and thanksgiving that you're accepted by God right now because of Jesus righteousness that covers you that's the beginning point for victory it's the pathway to victory I would like to ask this evening is there anyone here tonight who can say pastor Moore I've struggled with guilt and I have felt so unworthy every time I yielded but tonight you've given me a new way to approach my efforts for victory is there anyone here tonight that can say pastor Moore thank you tonight I've gained I've gained a new insight into how to gain the victory praise God praise God it's not going to be easy brothers and sisters especially if you're in the habit of condemning yourself every time you yield it's not going to be easy like I said this may be your greatest struggle a greater struggle initially at least to learn Jesus talk than it is to yield to struggle with the temptation I'm going to go so far as to say don't spend much time worrying about yielding to the temptation you're going to do it again it's practically guaranteed don't spend a lot of time worrying about that spend your time praising Jesus that the victory is in sight spend your time rehearsing in your mind what you're going to say the next time you yield and it's going to be Jesus talk that's what righteousness by faith means that's what justification means and that's the gospel and I thank you for letting me share it with you this evening